You've obviously all been very successful in your careers, but I know you must have experienced some challenges along the way that men don't have to face. What can you tell us about that? Uh, to be honest, the, the process from becoming an instructor, working with PASMA, there wasn't any challenges that side of it. It's just usually the attitude of some people that are attending the course. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I've had a completely positive experience from start to finish. I'm very impressed. Well done. <laughs> and Gillian? For myself, my challenges, I would say, back in the day, um, would be the fact that I'd have to deliver everything 110% more just to come level with a man's 60%. If that makes sense, okay. I don't mean that, you know. Um, no, but it was almost like you can just kill yourself working, but you're still never going to be as good as one of the lads, kind of thing. Gradually, and I can happily say that over the years, the uh, the attitude has changed for the better. Um, and again, I'll actually uh, enforce about that with the whole PASMA process. Very early on, I was treated equally, which was mm. which was refreshing. Gail, how about you? Um, certainly in the early days, we used to get people who rang up for equipment or training or whatever, and they wanted to speak to an expert, and when you questioned them further, what they meant by an expert was a man, uh, and they didn't think that women could be able to answer their questions. That, as you said, as Jill said, things have changed completely now. Um, we had uh, a woman training um, a trainer, and she had similar experiences as Jill early on, people, and, and as... Um, as Pam, you know, people thought she was uh, the secretary seeing them in or whatever. Um, and we're looking probably to put somebody through the PASMA training as well. Mm. So now, so that, uh, and I have put that out to the ladies that, in our business to, to see um, for them to do. Um, things have changed, I think, for a long time. Certainly when I first started the business, it, suppliers, customers, they just didn't think that women knew anything about, uh, you know, access equipment. Um, whether you did or you didn't, it was just a perception. Um, and a bit like Katie, I do quite a bit of work in schools so that uh, kids can see that, that there's, uh, girls particularly, that there are, um, there are openings out there that they wouldn't even have thought of. Thank you. Katie, I dare say you may not, certainly nowadays, be mistaken for the secretary sitting in your green. No, no. It's, um... And I think you come up against a few things, and I, I never felt like I fitted in, even from the interview process, which was the first process, and I turned up, and it was full of men, and, you know, I, I turned up for my recruitment job, and I sort of had a little dress on, and I thought, there's no chance I'm going to get this job. And then they offered me the job, and I said, it's not because I was a, the only woman in the room, was it? Because nobody wants to be the, the token woman either. Um, and then I sort of, I went through college, and there wasn't many women operating cranes in college, and then I went to site, and... I think site was the first time whether I questioned what I was doing. So I, I walked in, and that's a bit of a long story, but I walked in the room, essentially everyone stared at me. I was in the wrong place anyway. There was a lot of misleading information. I sort of walked to the back of the room and slid down and sat there and stayed there until everyone left. And it was at that point I questioned, what was I doing here? I didn't fit in. Why don't I go back to recruitment? And do I really want to do this? And I took that back to my company because I say if I was a younger apprentice or if that was my first job I would not have gone back for the second day I wouldn't have made the second day and then you go out onto site and you're just that woman in the crane what's that woman in the crane like what's her, everyone's expecting me to stick it through the building next door or something <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> not yet no. <laughs> it's always the first time and it's um, it's you do give it 110% because you want to be the very best you can be because you know everyone's expecting you to, to mess up, to do something wrong, to not be a very good crane operator. So you put a lot of pressure on yourself mm. to go over and above and be the very best you can. And I think, you know, I, I speak about sight and I said I was sort of sat in this crane and I was like the Pope in the Pope mobile and I had to sit there smiling and waving at people for like 12 hours a day. <laughs> it was just ridiculous. Good Lord. <laughs> What about in your career progression on that? Have you ever experienced being overlooked for promotion? Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you think that should have been my job, somebody else gets it? I've never experienced that myself. That's a bit too young. 
be it. Oh, yeah, thanks. I, I think, um, I, I know I'll go first this one, ladies. I've had, a, a, sadly, a, a few. I was once told by my manager director not to even consider having children until I'd run it past him. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was told seriously in an absolute straight conversation with a, a group of men in front of me saying, think how well you would have been, would have done in this industry if you'd been a man. <laughs> that was quote unquote, and I was kind of sitting there thinking, and at that time it was acceptable to to mm. take that on board. That was fine, you know. It's my fault. I've got boobs. Sorry, um, but uh, <laughs> now, thank goodness, the, the new generation don't have to listen to that exception. But I'd have to go into this, accept this, take it on board, and then go away and think how lucky I was that they've uh, allowed me to stay in the construction industry. But yeah, no, that's actual mm. things that actually happened to me. Yeah. I remember you telling me before about that that there, there was a, a particular route that women were expected to go and don't go into that side there because it ain't going to happen. Don't even bother applying for it. No, yeah. no. So is it the case, do you think then that, um, okay, we mentioned the construction industry and, and we're not only concerned about the construction industry because a, a lot of what we do is not in the construction industry. Um, but I'm sad to say that um, and within PASMA and uh, PASMA instructors, we reflect the same percentage. There are 2% of PASMA instructors are women. Um, is it, do you think, that women expect these challenges and that's what stops them entering construction or entering this industry? I, I think you can't, you can't be what you can't see. So if you've not got people out there doing that, um, young, young girls or girls that are coming into a, a career, they don't even think about going into construction because why would they? Because what they see is tends to be male plumbers, male decorators, male yeah. crane yeah. operators. So unless you get people like Katie to go in and talk to, to girls in school, they're not even thinking of those careers. Mm. Um, and it is coming slowly, but it's, it's very, very slow at the moment. Yeah, I agree. It is, it is, you can't be what you can't see. And it, even when they rang me up and they said that we've got a new apprenticeship, how do you feel about being a crane operator? And I thought, women don't do that. <laughs> they don't do that. It never even crossed my mind that a woman would operate a crane. And that's what it was like in school. Women didn't do them kind of things. And I think that's a lot of the reason why we do, it's important to do the school work, why it's important to put the pictures out there, to get role models mm -hmm. within your own company, to stand up and talk about what they do. And it's not, it's, it's not just women. I mean, there's a, we're coming up against a big deficit of workers and it's, what do we need to change within our industry in order to make things better for people? I remember I was at an event and there was a well-known CEO and I said, how are we gonna encourage young people to work in an industry that gets up at five in the morning and goes home at seven, eight o'clock at night? Mm -hmm. There's things we've got to change. It's not just attraction. How do yeah. we keep people in the industry once we've got them? Absolutely. I mean, there's not really much flexible working within construction. And there's no reason for anybody, whether you're male or female, why they shouldn't be more flexible oh, working. Yes. Jillian, yours? No, I that? agree with the ladies. Exactly that. You know, you, it can't be what you can't see, and that, that is a lot of what it is. I do find it's generational as well. I mean, my mum would never have dreamt of encouraging me into construction. Mm. Um, and again, I think we're in this. I like to think that we're coming out of the new generations. The young, the, the younger generations are, are aware that these opportunities are out there now, and it'd be nice to know that they won't even consider the fact of what sex they are to what job they can do they can do and it's both you know both sides and i think maybe it's the uh, the parents are educating their children now you know be what you want to do you know uh, i'm of a generation was you went in an office and you went in the garage or a bank you know that that's but now you can be anything you want to be and i think that's like you say pasma advertising it the construction industry advertising we just got to make people not aware I mean, isn't it it's sad in a way that we've got to go up to the girls going, do you want to do this? Yeah. You know, um, you've got to make it more aware that it's there, it's the opportunity's there. Isn't it strange that we go have this panel to talk about it? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't even notice that you put the word caution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Holy moly. I can tell you, that was Rona who came up with that title. Man. <laughs> so I reckon she's allowed to do it. <laughs> um, Pam, from your point of view, I, I heard you saying earlier that you had to convince or persuade your boss that you should be a, that you should be an instructor. Um, no, it wasn't it, the role I was the job I, I sort of interviewed for initially was from um, admin side, training side of it, with the progression mm -hmm. to go through to an instructor. So really? the company 
from right from the, the beginning, wanted that process to happen. So, so they have to be congratulated on being forward thinking in that way? Yes, so, very much so. so that, that, I can't even do that. I've done that. <laughs> I haven't you any longer, right? Fair enough. Um, is it important, does it matter, that there aren't many women in construction? Yes. Does it, <clears throat> yeah, it does matter. I'm just reading the question. <laughs> yeah. I'm, not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm just asking the question. <laughs> I think, I think any industry you should have more of a balance and you know you, you talk about a million plus men compared to 23 and is it 23 and a half mm. women it, it doesn't make sense you know it it's like anything um, dare I mention it you, you look at politics and you know mm. it, you get a better balance where you have both sexes mm. and there's a lot of jobs that, that women can do in construction but they don't even realize to apply for them. I mean, we, we, we hear quite often, some of the responses we get is the reason there are not so many women in construction is because they don't want to be in construction, right? So what can we do? Is that something that, you, that you've come <laughs> across? He looks very is nervous that, there when he's done this. Have you heard that? Is that something that, that is familiar to you? I think it's like, it comes down to lack of awareness. It's mm. not that women don't want to do it. And like, I spent 10 years in sales just thinking that was it and there's so many women out there and it's it's not just young women it's career changes mm. and things like that and it's just saying that you can do this you can do an apprenticeship when you're in your 30s mm. you can start again you st can learn new skills you can get tickets to operate cranes to operate machinery but it's it's just telling people that it's you know it's not that hard the opportunities mm. are out there and there's so many people who are willing to support you on this journey and especially sort of what PASMA are doing now, trying to get more women in and offering them the opportunity to see what people are doing. And I just think it's really good, but unless we're showing people what's out there, they're never going to go for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We all agree with that, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Do you think the times are changing though? 100%. They must be. 100%. Yeah. And, and for the better, yeah. absolutely. Are we doing enough? Could we do more? I think you can always do more. Mm -hmm. And I think apprenticeships are coming back into vogue anyway now. They yeah. were, you know, it was, oh, everyone had to go to university and, and whatever. But now, you know, kids are thinking more about apprenticeships. And, you know, if you put a full range of apprenticeships out there, including, you know, working in construction, working in, in, in all sorts of what were known as male-dominated um, industries, they're going to, you are going to get you know, girls that have a go, and especially when they can see role models. The more role models you get up there, the better it is. The more that people go out and talk about it, the more that they can see. Okay. Um, Jake? Yeah, I think male or female, to be an instructor and stand in front of a classroom full of men, you've got to, you've got to be that certain kind of person anyway and have that character. So I think personally targeting them, like you say, from, a, from school leaving age yeah. and up, and making it aware that it, it doesn't have to be, mm -hmm. you know, women don't have to be nurses and men don't have to go, like I say, driving cranes. It can be either or. Got you. I should just add in there, you just said something yourself, being a woman standing in front of men. I've also noticed on the other side of it, there's not that many women delegates. Mm -hmm. yeah. no. So I think they'd be nice to make them aware that it, even mm -hmm. from a, a, a membership or a customer base, to let them know that why not come. You know, in another panel today, I've heard they say something about the, uh, the high desk or the girls or whoever's answering the phone or the boys, if they don't know, if it is a girl, send her on the course. Mm. You know, there's no reason why these, the, the women should attend. Um, I've actually been at a centre or on, on site, should I say, where they're actually, and the thing is, you start building and, and all the men try and help you because they just assume you're not going to be able to do these things. Uh, and the girls are getting stuck in with the boys as well and there's, there's, there's no difference. And I think maybe letting delegates know that they can do it, even as being a woman as well. Mm. I don't know how many women you've trained. How many two. Women? Two. Two. Mm. <laughs> so, two. I've probably trained five or six max. Yeah. So that, even that percentage is worth looking at as well, isn't it? Well, yeah. to an extent, obviously, that's reflective of the number of women that are in the industry that are coming yeah. forward for training anyway. Yeah. So, you know, we need to yeah. address it on all fronts. Um, Kate, from your point of view, do you think there's more we could be doing? Is there... There's definitely more we could be doing, and I think it's um, it's very easy to put things like diversity down to a box ticking exercise. Mm. You know, yeah, here we're doing it. We're sticking out posters. We're doing this, but are you really doing it? Mm. Are you really diverse? Are you really inclusive? Are mm. you really trying to push it out there for everyone? And um, I think in terms of construction. 
I think the industry's got to change before, like I said, we're going to get people in, it's going to happen, you're going to get people interested, you can get women interested, and I sort of have conversations with my company, and I, we've got five female crane operators now out of 250, and um, it's like, what if we get a pregnant woman, what do we do? Oh, oh, we don't know, <laughs> can they climb a crane when they're pregnant? Do they have to stay on the ground? Are we able to do split shifts for people who have commitments? Because the average day of a crane operator is up at four. When I was working at Tottenham Court Road, I was up at five o'clock. I was supposed to finish at six. The lorry comes in, I finish at seven. I finish at eight. If you've got commitments mm -hmm. outside of work, we're just, you're not going to keep people in the industry. Well, that's, that could be the same for a man as well. I know, you know they might, they might have to, you know, it's not, if you make conditions better, it's better for both genders as well. Why, why can't you split shifts? That's why right. can't you have a day shift that's and right. evening shift? There's no, it's a little bit more work, takes a little bit more effort, but it's, it's not that hard. Yeah, it's doable, absolutely. Yeah. So, what advice would you give to these nice people out here um, in the audience who want to encourage more women into their organisations? What, what advice would you give them? I think it's do it for the right reasons. Yep. Uh, do it because you realise you need to do it because the diverse workforce is far better. Um, don't do it just to tick a box because it just won't work. You're not going to keep them. Okay. Deal? I think, I think definitely make, um, make conditions better. Flexible working is a big one, especially for, for women at, at, some, at some point in their life. They likely want to want to have some flexible working. Um, and it, again, it's better for, for both genders. And also, um, once you've started getting women in those positions, make sure that they're, they're very visible so that other people can see them. And they can, you know, people coming in can think, well, she's doing it. As you mm. said, you were probably the first crane driver. No, there's five. Mm. Um, there's not many companies that are going to have five female yeah. crane drivers. Absolutely. But once you get one in, uh, they, you know, they all do. And like Gillian with the, um, well, both being instructors, you know, it, you can be an instructor and be a woman, but how many women would think, oh, I'll go and be an instructor? It's not something that would ever go on their, their mm -hmm. mind. So the more visibility, the better. Yeah. I'd say anyone that's attended today and they're genuinely interested in um, encouraging women, ask, ask them. Mm. Ask them, tell them that it's available. Uh, especially within PASMA, with the um, women working in PASMA, we're all there. Me and Pam happy to take a phone call, encourage ladies and, you know, support them throughout that. And, and we actually had this conversation earlier when we said we've, we've got, I know, I know, at least two people that are dreadfully frightened of uh, standing up and talking uh, and shy, and, but they'd like to actually progress. So my theory is encourage them, become an instructor, and then we'll work with them to build the other elements they need to stand up in front of people and that. But don't not kind of, because you're slightly shy, don't go, no, I'm never doing that. If it's an interest, to talk to someone, talk to your staff, and if they want to go that way, that path, we'll guide them every, every step of the way. That's what I suggest. Okay, I think uh, what you could possibly introduce is a, a day of shadowing an instructor mm -hmm. to see that, like, yeah. a day in the life of, mm. yep. yeah, and see what it is actually involved in. really put them off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You could do you could do that in real life, or you could yeah. do a video. Pasma could do a video and put, put that up yeah. there so that people can see what That's it's all it. about. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's the um, unknown, say again? It's the unknown. It's the unknown you're yeah. and, and, it, and it's the involved. fear of the unknown, yeah. as you say. So, what would you say to people who simply think that women are welcome to work in the construction industry just the same as men? There's nothing stopping them. There is nothing stopping them, but it, is it? They, but but like we said, like they, don't, they don't know they can work yes. in construction. There's no one telling them they can work in construction. And, you know, a lot of us are left with certain stereotypes from school, which, you know, you don't, you don't think you can operate a forklift or operate a dumper truck. And I think in Australia, they, they have quite a lot of women who do this. Mm -hmm. But what are they doing differently to what we're doing? Sure. We're, we're missing something somewhere. Neat. I think it's all about encouraging, you know, yeah. encouraging people to, as you say, either change career because it's interesting or, or from school, we're getting that offer out there that they can do these things. Mm -hmm. Um, and once you get more in, it snowballs. It's, it's just encouraging more and more people in, so it snowballs. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wonder as well, you know, playing devil's advocate, do women have, are we being stereotypical towards the men? Are we assuming that if we go into construction, they're still going to treat us like the token bird? No, is there, is there that kind of...
kind of concept as well. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Is there young girls in school going, oh, I don't want to go on construction because I may be the only one there and I've listened to, like, you know, I've listened to Gillian and all the banter she took and that's not for me. Yeah. Well, actually, nowadays, it's not, not like that, you know. Mm. And, and if there is banter, and I'll be one of the first ones, I might like, shock you all, but I like a bit of banter. <laughs> and, uh, but there's a big difference between uh, rudeness and disrespectfulness mm. and a yeah. bit of a crack with your work colleagues, mm. basically. <laughs> uh, and actually, that may be might be that way we need to kind of clarify the actual um, environment you're in on site now. It is a lot more respectful. It isn't mm. uh, an aggressive or a leery kind of situation you're in. Um, it, you can enjoy your trade and work alongside a whole group of men and still feel, feel perfectly okay mm. if you are the only woman in the room. So I think that's maybe we need to kind of, because to be fair to you gents in the room, you know, I don't want to make it sound like you're all like, you know, sexist or, you know, but you're not. You, you, we work with you every day of the week and I think we should maybe make young girls aware or more mature ladies that want to change career that no it's not like that now it's not like that out there now okay thank you and possibly our attitude towards it as well could mm. have mm. the same effect make a difference yeah. if we don't make it an issue then yeah yeah, yeah. Say, it shouldn't be an issue no it isn't no sure it is, okay. that's why yeah. we're talking about it yeah i think sadly <laughs> it still is an issue and yes. you know the, a lot of the big corporates and you know i work on tideway i work on crossrail and Things like that aren't tolerated, but a lot mm. of the smaller subbies, a lot of the house builders, yes. things like that still are to tolerated. I moderate a group called Women on the Tools, and some of the things I read on it is genuinely shocking. Yes. It would never happen on a large construction site. So are we, how are we getting the message out there to our subbies? Yeah. How are we pushing that out there to make sure they take on and boards the same qualities that we are? I think that, to be honest, that's a recurring theme in everything we talk about, yeah. right? The people who are here are the people who are buying into this mm. stuff. The people who are not here, who are the most difficult to get to, are the ones that we have the issues with, and we just need to keep working on how do we get to those hard to, hard to reach um, organisations. I think sometimes it's perceptions. You know, men and women probably both perceive that they're they're dirty, heavy duty jobs, mm. and a lot of the jobs aren't particularly mm. dirty no. or heavy duty. Mm. So there is opportunities there for, for women to do. Yeah. And, and a lot of women can do, you know, being a marine might be a bit of stretch too far, but there are a lot of jobs that women can do, that, mm. that men do, that, you know, they've got the strength to do as well. I mean, mm. Jill's obviously, mo well, Jill and Pam are obviously moving large pieces of uh, metal tubing, um, and it's not stopping them doing a, a really good job. So. You know, you shouldn't think that just because you're a woman you can't do it because, or, or men shouldn't think just because you're mm. a woman you can't do it because you're not strong enough. Mm. As you say, they rush to help you to, to yeah, do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is nice. <laughs> I didn't say I didn't stop them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to open up to the audience now. Do, does anyone oh, have any no. questions? Yeah, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a question, it's an observation. Yes. Jill, you said it's generational. It is. You're talking about Australia. Now, in Australia, everyone's a mate. There's no real man, female. You can do the job, do the bloody job. Yeah. You know, in this country, our parents, you're a little girl, you can't be doing things, doing things like that. It's generational. It's changing because the modern children today, they're more equal. They're much more equal. Women footballers, women rugby players. You know, 10, 20 years ago, you wouldn't think of that. But we're becoming more and more equal. But what we must do as an industry and maybe as a generation, is to get this word out. Mm. Advertise. Mm. If, you can't see, if you can't buy a product, if you can't see it, you mm. don't buy the product. That's it. So yep. if you know that product's there, then people will buy that product. So we should advertise. I don't know how or, or, or any way like that, but we should get the word out more mm. and more. We, in our factory, we have two women welders. Mm. And when people, we people walk around the factory, they're quite shocked. They're, oh, you're two women welders. You know, so, my God, what are they doing welding? Well, the fact that they're better than the bloody men is, is material. <laughs> but this is the point. You know, everybody can do the job, but you've got to get out the message that it's there for them to do. Absolutely. Yeah, Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions or observations? There's a gentleman up the back there. Shouldn't that be paper at work? Yeah. <laughs> Rona, you need to get that sorted, by the way. <laughs> it was Rona who done it, not doing me. I'm just the front man. <laughs> I'm the front person, sorry. I'm the front person. <laughs> <laughs> so. Mine's a question to the panel, really. What's their thoughts about positive discrimination in the industry? Ooh. 
please feel free to speak with us. <laughs> right. um, what I would say is positive discrimination is not on. We can't do it. We, we can undertake some positive action, which I will speak about in a moment. However, please I, feel free. I think it, it still should be the right person for the right mm. job, but we need to get more women applying. Say if we have a 50-50 mix, men and women, we take people on who are the best candidates, but if the candidates aren't there, they're never going to be taken on anyway. I think it's a danger going down the positive discrimination because, what, as you say, what you want is the right person for the right job. You want them to be doing a good job. So if you're positively discriminating and, and, and employing a woman and there's a man that's, for some reason, going to be mm. doing a better job, it, it's not good for anybody. Yeah, no, I agree completely. Exactly what mm. you're saying. You're in a slippery slope and dodgy mm. ground when you go down that one. Right. Sue? Yeah, I was going to say, if something as a company we're guilty of, and I noticed because we're not showing enough women, are we? We're certainly not showing enough women on our website, the newsletters that we send out. And I think, as you said, you've got to be visible, you've got to be seen to be in it. Mm. And if we probably look through um, many, many websites, we won't see women on the websites that are related to construction, whereas it, it would be so easy. To do that. Well, that, that's an interesting point, Sue, because we had actually briefed our people when they reviewed that to make sure that they got a gender balance. So if they've not done it, I'll make a look at it again. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually funny you saying that, Sue. Did you see outside in the archive stuff? I, I, uh, well, unfortunately, I missed Paul's presentation, but I didn't know if he did not leave. But the puzzle stuff I show you out there that there's um, girls, it's very, it's very, it's very it's, clad, yes, yeah. exactly, mm. barely wearing anything, laying on towers, mm. and that was the only kind of women picture you did get. Um, <laughs> not that we do it now. I think we'd more like to get the boys doing it, but. Uh, I, I, <laughs> but have, uh, I have to observe. I'll let you finish. I have to observe. Paul Pritchard was the man that was responsible for that. There you go. Yeah. Positive. He, he, was, he was the product manager and marketing guy. Yeah. Really? Did yeah. you actually organise that, Paul? I mean, uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> He's not committing. <laughs> and how do you feel about that now? <laughs> I'll just say, uh, the reason I asked for um, about positive discrimination, because some of you know I get involved in politics quite a bit, and where there is positive, and it was quite painful the other day to be told you can't stand with a candidate because you're too male, pale, and stale. Oh. But it, it certainly sort of struck a cold in me and made me think, Jeez, oh, he's right, you know, they're right. And I think there, is, there might even be a role of positive discrimination. It mm. sort of makes people stop and think, you know, particularly those people who are in the 70s might have been doing photos and photos. I seem to remember at the time that that was cutting edge. We were, we were, we, we were making the transition from being as how scaffolding companies were perceived, which is under railway arches and things like that. And this was a move towards, like, if you look at it, it's kind of based on the motor show and the boat mm, show. Yeah, and, yeah. and it was all cutting edge at the time, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, any other questions? Take one last question. So you got it? Flexibility of your uh, bars is, is, um, is interesting. One, obviously, what we're finding uh, over the last number of years is learning how to deal with not just everyone in the workplace, but the younger people coming through. And we've had to be really flexible. Um, everyone on the panel has said, talked about flexibility. Um, I think businesses are recognising. But do you think businesses should be doing more uh, in terms of this flexibility? And how, what else could we do to encourage it? Who's going to go with that one first? I think we can do I know it's I know it's sort of in plant operating and what we do, it can be quite tricky, but it's not impossible. I think as an industry we tend to be quite a few years behind other industries that manage flexibility quite well. Mm. And um, it's not just flexibility for women. I mean we talk about mental health a lot and then we'll have people working seven days on a site, six, seven days on a site, 12 hour, 13 hour days away from home. How often are they see in their families and things? I think it's just, there's a lot of rules that go on high up. There's a lot of things, yeah, we're brilliant, flexible working, mm. Janet goes home late, uh, John comes in early, all this lot. But when it comes to a, on the ground level and the people working on sites, we're failing them. We're failing mm. them massively. Mm. Um, you know, construction has one of the highest suicide rates. And, and I, I do believe that a lot of it has to do with flexibility and us not being flexible enough as an industry. 
I think I think flexibility uh, uh, benefits both sides, women and men. Mm. I think the more flexible you bring in, you know, a lot of men want to be able to go and see the child at, at school doing mm. such a thing. And if it's if it's brought in to be more flexible, both sides benefit. It's just it's just a win win. Mm. Um, but it's companies, you know, making making definite positive moves to to put that in place. No, I agree. The trouble is, and I get this, I, I, and I take on board your point, and it's very true, sometimes you get these higher levels that are making these great decisions and putting these policies down and it looks great on paper, but they can't remember the last time they were on that pit face mm. when you're up against a job and you've got people screaming at you and you're, you're rigging and you've got to get this facade down and you've got to be off site. And I haven't got time to wait for Johnny to come in and book on and take over my job because everyone's screaming at me. Mm. So I, I, I don't know where you find that fine balance. Mm. At the moment, we're clearly not achieving it. Mm. Uh, but again, even in, with my section within a higher assembly, there's very few of us already. So I haven't even got a backup to come in and go, mm -hmm. tag, yeah. off you go. Yep. If a job's got to be done, the job's got to be done. And I'm yeah. right there with you, you know, our average day is probably between 12 and 14 hours just to get the job done to make sure that we're all in again tomorrow. So I, I'd love to say that there is this crystal ball that we can mm. find this perfect. Uh, and I'd take on board anyone that finds that, let me know, I'll be the first to take it on board. Yeah. But I, I think it's difficult. I think we've got quite an actual, and please correct me if I'm wrong, at the moment on some industries and some uh, businesses, I think the front, the pit face and the top people, there's this big void. Disconnected. Yeah. They're, they're completely disconnected. So uh, maybe the first step is to get them to, to see each other's sides yeah. of it mm. and then work forward maybe. I, th I think a lot of it's understanding people as well. We have a lot of agency workers and you know, Dave stands up and he says, I need to leave two hours early today. And they go, hold up, he's being awkward, he's agency, let's yes. ship him out. So what do we do? We get rid of him, yep. we get someone else in. I mean, is that how we treat people, mm. really, who have things mm. to do and problems and things they need to overcome? And I think it's just, it's understanding that, you know, people are still people. They're the same up here as they are down here, and we've all got things we need to deal with. Pam, do you want to say something? I think as, a, as companies, the, the most basic thing is just to support, mm -hmm. support and work with them. That, I work for a really supportive company. Mm -hmm. company. I'm a single parent, so mm -hmm. there is some times where mm -hmm. I may need to you know, leave early and they completely support me, but I'll give them them, them hours back mm -hmm. in other ways, so okay. it swings around about, as I say. Cal, anyone? Yeah. I'd just like to make a statement, really, because it is a, um, a move. I mean, I've been to the things five lady traders, or mm -hmm. other traders, actually employed to, but just reflecting back upon the industry, and even the people you trade, change is beginning to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we are seeing the gas fitters, the plumbers, the electricians come through. You know, 50% of our sales fields, uh, sales are, you know, um, Females as well, mm. and they do just as good a job as anything. He's changed within the construction sector, and I think you know we can see that coming through mm. as well. But it's down to people like yourselves as well uh, being in that. So I'd like to thank you for your work as well. Thank you. Thanks from Carl. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> uh, I heard something interesting on the radio the other day, which I, uh, which may have some bearing on it, and this was <laughs> in relation to flexible working, and what this. Um, caller was saying was businesses are stepping up to the market and they're becoming more flexible and thinking in terms of how can we support our employees, how can we support our employees to get the work-life balance right. I think what this person said was but the only sector that does not work to try and improve that is the public sector. Right? Schools are not flexible. Mm. Right? Schools start at a time, finish at a time, they've got their fixed terms and when the term is finished and it's holiday time, all of a sudden the holiday prices go up, and then you get penalised if you take your kids out. <laughs> if you take your kids out of school to take them on holiday early, because you've got to get a better deal. Okay. Um, thank you very much, panel. I'm going to just go up and say a few words in respect of where Pasma is in this. So if you just bear with me, and I'll, I'll, I'll do it as quickly as I can. I mentioned to you before that. Um, only 2% of PASMA instructors are female. That doesn't really work since 50% of the world is female. Um, we may not be able to change the world, um, but 
where we can make a difference, we should make a difference. You mentioned before, there's not, there's not that many female delegates coming through. I don't know how much we can do about that. I certainly would say that, that a lot of that is down to the construction industry and other industry to try and encourage them to come through. But we can do, we can do something. And from our point of view as an industry, we don't want to encourage positive discrimination, but we want to take positive action. We want to make it easier for employers to engage prospective employees. And how we're going to do that is we're going to try and redress the balance. Because when I learned that only 2% of private instructors, I was asked the question actually at an HSS conference when I was accosted by two female instructors who were employed by HSS, and they challenged me and said, how many female instructors are there? I said, I don't know. I don't know. Because we don't actually ask that. We don't ask, what are you, male or female? When we formed the Women in Plasma group to start with, the only way we could find out was to go through and look at the names. Right? <laughs> and we had to look through this, and it was a, a manual search through the names to try and find what we thought were females. And we got it wrong, we missed one out. <laughs> and we had a phone call from one of our, one of our members to say, eh, you've called together this uh, PASMA female instructors and, and you've, missed, you've, missed, you've missed yours out. And we did explain to them, look, it's not, it wasn't scientific. We were actually physically going through, checking the names to see if we could actually fish out who the, instructors, who, who the female instructors were. We are um, announcing a package of support for any woman who wants to become a PASMA training instructor. What we are going to do is we are going to offer free places for women in our instructor training course. That means we are waiving the £1,200 that it costs. Um, we will help them fast track their way to obtaining the knowledge and experience they need to qualify for the course. There will be no need to demonstrate 12 months experience. We will fast track it. If they want to make sure it's the right career move for them, which I think is something we were talking about before, we will arrange for them to sit in on a training course run by a female instructor so they can see what it's like to do the job. We'll hold mentoring sessions to prepare them for dealing with some of the unhelpful remarks and questions that we've heard described by our panel. We'll put them in touch with women who already do the job and can act as a support network in the early days. It's going to take a sustained positive action from our point of view to redress this, so that's what we're doing and that's why we're doing it. Um, where we can make a difference, we aim to make a difference. If there are any women here today or even back at the office or back in your place um, in your organisation who might be interested in this opportunity, please stop by, speak to Helen, I don't know if she's in here just now, yeah there she is at the back there, Helen Parson, um, on the plasma information stand outside this room. Uh, can I ask you please to join me in thanking our panel members for sharing their stories with us. Um, I'm sure we've all taken something away from it. Um, and we can take it back into our businesses to try and make changes, no matter how small. Uh, that help to move us towards a world where women and men are equally represented in construction and in PASMA and all other places. Um, I sure would like to see a world where our daughters and our granddaughters, I've got both, um, I've not got great granddaughters yet, could succeed in our industry without the barriers that Gail, Gillian, Pam and Katie had to break through. Thank you.